we're here to celebrate 50 years of genealogical credentialing. 50 years of the rigorous development and dissemination of genealogical standards. And you know, this photograph that you're looking at here, it's a then and now photograph of New York's Bowling Green Park. It illustrates that we've really come a long way, baby. The people who photographed this park in 1907 couldn't have imagined the Creative Commons license that I'm using tonight to be able to show you this composite 2013 image. The fact is that the standards process that was begun by ASG 50 years ago, I'm not sure people who began it could have imagined the challenges that still remain for us today as we look at and evolve into the 21st century. I suspect that the people who were involved in that process were more familiar, perhaps, with problems posed by people like this man. Now, John Casper Branner was born in Tennessee in 1850. He was a geologist by education. He was, in fact, the state geologist of Arkansas. He was a member of the founding faculty of Stanford University and served as the second president of Stanford University. He was also an amateur genealogist. And in 1913, he wrote a book. It's called Casper Branner of Virginia and His Descendants. It was privately published at Stanford University. It meticulously details this gifted geologist's foray into the world of genealogy. So how do I know about John Casper Branner? John Casper Branner and I are third cousins, three times removed. <laughs> he and I are both descended from the Baker family of Virginia and North Carolina. And if you can name a state that's south of the Mason-Dixon line, we're there. You can read what he wrote about the Branner family on Internet Archive, which is one of many sites that now reproduce these pre-1923 publications. You can go over to Amazon, shell out, what is it, $27.39 for the paperback and a little bit under $40 for the hardback. But I don't want this book. This is the Branner's. And I'm a descendant of the Bakers. So you can just imagine how happy I was when I found this. This is from the Stanford University Library. It's a collection of John Branner's private papers. And when you look at the scope and the content of that collection, it's got a manuscript of the Baker genealogy. So. Could I resist? Not for a minute. I wrote off to the library. I paid a ridiculous amount of money. I got every piece of paper on the Baker family that's in that entire collection. I couldn't wait for the mail to come in. And I waited, and I waited. And it finally got there. And I was so happy, and I started looking through it. And it turns out that every single thing that my gifted academic cousin had relied on, correspondence. He sent out a letter to every town clerk, county clerk, in most of the southern United States and said, do you know anybody who's a baker? Maybe related to like this guy David Baker? And then he wrote to every one of those bakers what he collected in those personal papers, what is in that wonderful manuscript collection is roughly the same genealogical quality as there were three brothers who came to America. One went north and one went south and one went west and was never heard from again. 
what I want to know is what is it out here in the West? What, are there dragons out here? Everybody who came West disappeared. All right. So my cousin John Brenner is not the only geneolo genealogist to have relied in whole or in part on correspondence. It's only going to cost you $595 in hardback, $305 if you're willing to go used. You can get the entire seven volumes of the abridged compendium of American genealogy, First Families of America, a genealogical encyclopedia of the United States by Frederick Virkus. Now, so much of Virkus's work was not based on personal research in any kind of the repositories that we would think of as good genealogy. It was also based in large measure on writing to others and getting their answers back. But at least people like Virkus and like my cousin John Casper Brenner, they were well-intentioned. We may be able to think of one or two people who probably don't quite fit into that category. Um, this is 1912 New York. The secretary of the American Genealogical Society was a man by the name of Gustav Anjou. Now, if that's not bad enough, he's listed a second time in the same directory under the Bs. He's also with the British American Record Society. He, kind of lucky he didn't start the War of 1912. <laughs> what he managed to pull off was good enough, <laughs> if I can use that term, it got him his whole personal entry in Wikipedia. One of the subheadings on this page is genealogical fraud, and he's described this way. Few, if any, names in genealogical circles draw the outrage that Anjou enjoys. <laughs> now, what Anjou did, as aptly described by Gordon Remington and Robert Charles Anderson, was fleece the unsuspected. He produced beautiful works. They are beautiful products, like this early history of the Freeman family. These are star-studded genealogies telling people, among other things, that they can be entitled to use coats of arms from their illustrious English ancestors. And of course, they were always illustrious English ancestors. There were no pig farmers, no horse thieves in any Anjou genealogy. And who's going to argue with this guy? I mean, after all, he was credentialed. He was a member of the Harleian Society, the Parish Register Society, the American Historical Association, etc., etc. What more could anybody want? As Bob Anderson pointed out in his 1991 article, we was robbed. <laughs> Even in the 1980s, people were still defending Anjou's work. One guy wrote that he had to believe what Anjou said. Anjou had all of these credentials, including a PhD. The PhD he had awarded to himself. <laughs> Even today, you can find Andrew's work all over the place. If you're a Freeman descendant, just hop on to Amazon. You can buy a copy of this Andrew genealogy of your family. It's only a few dollars. And while you're there, don't forget to buy any one of the other 23 Andrew publications that are still available for sale today on Amazon. But you know, as bad as this may be, for genealogy. For us as a profession, it was probably worse when we get into the broad genealogical frauds, things like the Baker estate hoax. Now, a little bit more than 100 years ago, an unscrupulous bunch of folks, self-styled genealogists among them, started telling people that some of the most valuable land in the nation 
It was in downtown Philadelphia. It included City Hall, the Pennsylvania Railroad Terminal. It had all been owned by a Revolutionary War soldier named Jacob Baker. And if you could prove a relationship to Jacob Baker, you were in for a share of an estate that ran into the hundreds of millions of dollars. You didn't have to work very hard to prove your descent. You sent in $10 or $20 or $50 or $100 to some operator, and he'd take care of those pesky little proof issues. Now, it didn't seem to matter a whole lot that people were warned over and over that this was a hoax. Even in Wyoming in 1921, don't be swindled just because your name may be Baker. But people were taken in by the thousands. I have to believe in my own family that the only possible explanation why Thomas Baker, where every single solitary fact about this man places him in Virginia, except my family wants him to be born in Pennsylvania. <laughs> it's got to be the Baker hoax. Now, you might think that people would have learned from this sort of thing, but the fact is, dozens of people were prosecuted in connection with this. It was proved to be a fraud in court case after court case all the way into the 1930s. But genealogical fraud is a little bit like a hydra. You cut off one head and another one pops up someplace else, like the Baker, uh, sorry, Buchanan estate hoax. Now this Buchanan land now is not Pennsylvania, it's New York, it's in Brooklyn. And allegedly a brother of President James Buchanan had left this land and all you had to do was prove you were a Buchanan just by sending in your money and you two could share in an estate that was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And again, every bit of it was a hoax. Denials by the governor of New York, a fellow by the name of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, didn't do a thing to stop people. And yeah, before you ask, I am also a Buchanan descendant. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I am a descendant of a Baker-Buchanan marriage. So I get this from both sides. But I'm not going to complain. I am not complaining one bit. It is true that some of my kinfolk were taken in. But what that meant was they all went running to places like the Burke County, North Carolina courthouse, and they wrote out affidavits with all of the old family Bibles. That's my third great grandmother. List. She's the one who married the baker, by the way. <laughs> Listed in this affidavit. But for us as a community, this is embarrassing. You know, it was written up in the Reader's Digest, for Pete's sake. <laughs> The indictment in the Reader's Digest was damning. There were 25 estates most commonly used as lures. Not necessary to be a direct descendant. The genealogist attends to that. He can furnish a tree proving anybody under the sun to be in the direct line. Did you notice he didn't even use a tree from ancestry? <laughs> Not one? Okay. The scheme serves as a perpetual revenue for, we won't mention the chiseling lawyers, and genealogical sharpers throughout the country. Ow. You know, this clearly was a pivotal moment in the history of the genealogical community. Whatever credibility genealogy was going to have, whatever it might hope to have, was hanging in the balance. Something had to be done. You all know what's coming, right? ASG, formed in 1940, designed to foster the training of genealogists, 
eliminate improper and unethical practices, and establish a code of ethics and standards for the field of genealogy. Now, I hope the fellows in the room are going to forgive me if I don't take a lot of time to talk about ASG. You've had your golden anniversary celebration. It's time today to celebrate your brainchild, the creation of ASG's founders, the credentialing of genealogists, and the adoption of rigorous standards for our profession. The notion of certification, of credentialing, didn't start with ASG in 1940. It really can be traced back to Donald Blinds Jacobus in 1930. In his groundbreaking work, Genealogy as a Pastime and Profession, he wrote, any person, regardless of education, experience, or natural ability, can set up to be a professional genealogist. No course of training is required. No examinations as to fitness have to be passed. For this very reason, the profession appeals to many who lack the mentality for this kind of work. <laughs> now, didn't happen right away. Thirteen years later, Milton Rubicam, too many inexperienced persons are calling themselves professional genealogists when they lack proper training for this specialized type of work. The society should investigate the capabilities of professional genealogists and, if satisfied with their credentials, should permit them to so stay. But you know, even with people like Jacobus and Rubicam calling for certification, Credentialing got off to a really slow start. If we look at it as a timeline, we can start in 1930 with Jacobus and his call for credentialing. Then 13 years go by. Rubicam calls for credentialing. 18 years go by. Finally, ASG starts considering a credentialing system. And what's happening on the other side of the country? The Genealogical Society of Utah finds that it can't keep up with the research requests that are coming in to its people that it has trained. 1962, ASG appoints a committee to investigate the possibility of credentialing. Out here, GSU again is falling behind in trying to keep up with the requests. 1963, ASG appoints a certification committee, and GSU appoints a testing committee. 1964, the Board for Certification of Genealogists was officially formed. Milton Rubicam was its first chairman. Carlton Fisher was its first president of the Board of Trustees. That same year, 1964, Eric Christensen became, let's get back one, became the first person to test and get a credential as an AG. In 1965, Dr. Jean Stevenson became the first CG in the United States or anywhere. In 2000, the torch was passed from GSU to ICAPGen to continue the AG program. In 2005, BCG consolidated its credentials so that it's the CG going forward. And we did a very careful check to see about the numbers over the years. And between BCG and ICAPGen and GSU, in these 50 years of credentialing, there have been more than 2,000 men and women who have gotten credentials as genealogists. That's amazing. That's really amazing. Now, this is the search function of the BCG website. And it 
points out that there are some gluttons for punishment out there. Because you can drop down that search box and search only for people who also have the AG credential. There are 13 gluttons for punishment out there. I suspect that we may have a few of these amazing overachievers here in the room tonight. Um, I'm not supposed to name any names, but these people know who they are. Let's see, uh, Paul Graham, uh, Diane Lindsley, uh, somebody named Rancher. Jeez Louise. It, and I understand, by the way, that at least one of these people is has just today achieved a different milestone. <laughs> Where are you, Diane? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Diane. Happy birthday to you. I promised you I was going to embarrass somebody tonight. Now, we have the great good fortune even today as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of credentialing, to be able to call on some of the senior members of our community to benefit from their wisdom. I was able to determine who the longest living credentialed genealogists are. For the AG credential, it is Laureen Yaosi, shown here in her younger days, and the longest credentialed CG is one of the fellows. It's John Frederick Dorman of Virginia. Now, as the years have gone by, the achievements and accomplishments of the credential community have grown. The goals set by the fellows have driven those efforts. Perhaps the stellar achievement of the credentialed community is the development of genealogical standards. Between 1997 and 2000, BCG honed, refined, and expounded on the genealogical proof standard. It produced the first ever genealogical standards manual, a guide to the best practices of our field. That's been followed by other works of significance to the goal of ensuring that all genealogists, and not just credential genealogists, but everybody, understand and apply these best practices. And here in this room tonight are the authors, or at least some of the authors, of two new works our community can be very proud of. In 2012, ICAP Jen's outstanding set of essays, Becoming an Excellent Genealogist. And in 2013, the new book from the National Genealogical Society, Mastering Genealogical Proof by Thomas Jones. And when you consider all of these things, we've got pretty good reason to be very pleased with where we are, how far we've come as a community of credential genealogists. And yet, and yet the future is coming on us fast. The sheer speed with which it's approaching, it's producing issues we're going to have to confront, challenges we're going to have to overcome. I can think of three particular issues I think are probably most relevant to our community today as we consider standards for the 21st century. The first one I'm going to mention is the one that I think perhaps is the most intractable in terms of finding any kind of a solution. That's the constant and repeated allegation that somehow the very act of setting and insisting on standards is somehow elitist. Elitist. You know, I went to the dictionary. It says the elite are people who enjoy superior status due to intellect, achievement, and economic wealth. I figured two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> now, if, if there's anybody out there who's, who's got all three, 
I want you to know that I'm single. I have all of my teeth. I'll meet you by the elevator afterwards. But look, for the rest of us, this problem comes up time and time again. You know, I, I just read some comments that were posted online by a longtime genealogist in a western state. I won't name him, but he says, I seldom have contact with the upper echelons of genealogical research. None of those who inhabit the rarefied atmosphere of the many lettered would deign to give me the time of day, much less have me as a Facebook friend or talk to me at a conference. And he didn't stop there. He said, I don't work for any of the large genealogical organizations. I have the wrong combination of letters after my name. I haven't had the opportunity of spending a thousand hours at the family history library. I live on the wrong side of the tracks, and I don't wear the stylish clothes. <laughs> that I was trained as a lawyer, right? Now, that's a profession that's taken its share of legs. <laughs> we tell the story that of the, the father who says, my son is a lawyer, but don't tell his mother. She thinks he plays the piano in a bloody house. <laughs> we tell the story of California having the most lawyers and New Jersey having the most toxic waste sites because New Jersey got first choice. <laughs> But I've got to tell you, it's been a shock, a shock to find out that I am more welcomed in some genealogical circles because of these letters after my name instead of those letters after my name. Now, we all know that this kind of divisiveness is nothing new in America. It is certainly not limited to the genealogical community. <laughs> you will notice that I put one very carefully on the left and the other very carefully on the right. Now, I don't know, I don't know where the bridge is between those of us with the initials after our names and those who don't have them. It's a divide I don't think I really understand. And because I don't understand it, I don't know how it can be cured. What I do know is that when it comes to standards, there is no room for compromise. My friend Don Devine said it very well in a mail list posting in 2006. He said, it is neither snobbery nor elitism to insist that genealogy be believable, that it be based on convincing evidence for any asserted relationships whether biological, legal, social, or anthropological. <laughs> On a more personal note, my friend and colleague Polly Fitzgerald Kimmett took a different tack on her personal blog in 2012. She wrote, I pursued certification because I wanted to know how well I measured up against professional standards in the field. She said, I do not want to lord my credentials over anyone, but I worked really, really hard, learned a lot, and then she added the key words. And I am not going to apologize for that. Nor am I, nor should we, nor should we, nor will we back away from our commitment to standards because there are a few people out there who don't understand it. We do the future no favors by cutting corners. Put simply, it's not going to happen. What is going to happen is that we are going to have to face other challenges. Challenges, for example, like the ones posed by DNA evidence. It's a bit of a shock to some longtime genealogists that DNA evidence as part of genealogical proof is not a fad. It's not going anywhere. 
Just one week ago today, the President General of the Daughters of the American Revolution announced that DAR was going to join SAR in permitting the use of DNA evidence as part of a proof argument in support of membership. Now, some of us in this room are a little bit older than some of the others in this room. It may be a little uncomfortable for us old dogs to learn new tricks, but it's an invaluable and important addition to the 21st century genealogist's toolkit. And as the kids say, we need to get with it. Because DNA evidence shows what's hidden in the deepest resource recesses of our genetic code, it also presents some unique ethical challenges. As much as we think we know and understand paper trails, the fact is that DNA evidence can upset that apple cart. It can undercut a paper trail just as surely is as it can support it. And by its very nature, it's going to disclose things the paper trail can't. Geneticist Megan Smolenyak was surprised in her own family to discover that her uncle was her grandmother's son, but not her grandfather's son. There was nothing, not so much as a hint in the paper trail that that was true. It was only through DNA testing that it came out, and only through the newest kind of DNA testing, autosomal testing. She said, before autosomal testing, that's a secret that would have gone to the grave with my grandmother. Not anymore. Now, not everybody is going to be happy with this kind of a discovery. You know, put yourself in the position of somebody who's a member of DAR, perhaps whose membership is of long standing. It's a sure bet there are going to be some really long faces when, and it's when, not if, we're going to find out that somebody who's a member isn't entitled to membership. What happens when that paper trail gets upset? I have to tell you, though, it's never really bothered me to upset this kind of a paper trail. I'm not really convinced that it's a good thing to focus quite so much on bloodlines. It's always struck me as being a little odd that a child who may have been born to a loyalist father but was raised by his mother's patriot family, isn't qualified for the DAR, but the other way around. As long as the child was born to a patriot, he may even raise the loyalist, but it's okay. That seems to me to miss the point of what family history is all about. And what's clear to me is that technology is on my side. This is the third challenge we have to confront with standards in the 21st century, because technology is rapidly redefining what it means to be a family. And genealogy, and particularly the genealogy of our lineage societies, has often been defined very narrowly. Merriam-Webster defines it as an account of the descent of a person from an ancestor. It gives synonyms, bloodline, lineage. So it's natural when we think about genealogy, even our database programs, it's mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, back through the generations. Technology is upsetting that paradigm. Families today can be formed in very different ways. Just this year, in New Jersey. This is the fact pattern that our courts were confronted with. And the question here is who are the parents of this child? Now, it's a sure bet I couldn't enter this in my database program. <laughs> the real issue under New Jersey law, if there's a sperm donor involved, dad becomes dad on the birth certificate. 
But in this case, mom couldn't carry the kid to term. So the question was, could mom be mom on the birth certificate? This case split the New Jersey court, the New Jersey Supreme Court, right down the middle. It was a three to three decision with one member stepping aside. Now, as genealogists, we can't punt. When it comes to a case like this, it's our job to record accurately and completely the facts that constitute a family. And family is not a word that's ever been narrowly defined. Never has been, never will be. Merriam-Webster today, first definition, a group of individuals living under one roof and usually under one head. And it's crystal clear that today, to be a family, it may not even be mom and dad. It could be mom and mom. It could be dad and dad. These families, traditional and otherwise, are the people we work with. It's our role as genealogists to carefully document these families every bit as much as it falls to us to document those lineages that get people into those societies. And along the way, our tools, our thought processes, maybe even our hearts are going to have to change. But we're not faithful to our task if we don't understand or if we don't admit that family is a lot more than bloodlines. As a group, as a field, as a profession, we're focused on the past. So are we ready for these future challenges? You know, since we're talking about standards, we might consider how we can tell. How far have we come? So I, I'm going to beg the forgiveness of some of the people in this room if I tell you that I'm particularly heartened by one type of evidence of the distance that we've come. Because, you know, as I was putting this talk together, I was reminded of a comment made by a fellow in 1951. He was preparing the index for a multi-volume work. He wrote a note at the beginning of the index, and he said, the compiler felt that a female index, apart from name of father or husband, would hardly be worth the additional labor from a standpoint of genealogical research. Males dying unmarried are not indexed. And I couldn't help but think, as I was putting this talk together, about the people who were going to be here tonight. You see, I knew in the audience tonight would be the immediate past president of the American Society of Genealogists. I knew it would also have the president of the Board for Certification of Genealogists. I knew we would have the president of the International Commission for the Accreditation of Professional Genealogists and the director of the Family History Library and the very newest member of the BCG Board of Trustees, having taken office all of about three hours ago, Laurel Beatty. And even the very newest, brand spanking newest credentialed genealogist announced what? 72 hours ago, Melinda? <laughs> Melinda Henningfield, our newest credentialed genealogist. here tonight shares that characteristic that, shall we say, wasn't quite so apparent in earlier years. I mean, I don't see any earrings anywhere in this group of fellows from 1976. So as I see it, for many, many reasons, many, many reasons, the future is very bright indeed. Just look around, look around, particularly at the faces of the young people who are here tonight. Men and women committed 
to credentialing, to genealogy, and to working to standards. I am so very proud of where we are. I am so very excited about the road that lies ahead. I'm so pleased to be in this community and to be in this company tonight as we make that journey into the next 50 years guided by the standards of the 21st century. Thank you.